in the, the harsh winter, we would go into warehouses and play on proper concrete floors. You know, you see futsal now, it was, it was before futsal. And blasted in brilliantly by Tim Ream. I think the one thing driving me on right now is showing my kids that it doesn't matter how old you are. If you're good enough, you're old enough. If you're good enough, you're young enough. Tim, welcome to the big interview. Uh, great to see you, and I know we've got some brilliant food on the way. So in the meantime, I suppose, just looking back at the season that's been so far, it's been, it's been eventful for you. Mm, yeah, very eventful. Um, lots of ups and downs, um, but ultimately uh, another fairly successful one in, in terms of, uh, you know, keeping our place in, in, the, you know, in the Premier League. Um, obviously not guaranteed yet, but um, yeah, we'd, we'd like to think that we're, we're pretty much there, but yeah, overall, uh, can't complain. We'll talk more football in a second, but I'm always fascinated about your journey. So you, let's, let's rewind the clock, shall we? Uh, St. Louis in Missouri, yep. where you grew up. An interesting place in many respects, because it's got rich history yeah. in terms of youth development for soccer in the States. Huge. Uh, going back, I mean, decades. Um, you can, you can go back all the way to 1950, um, the 1950 team that actually beat England. Um, six St. Louisans on, on, the, on the team. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a place where so many kids grow up playing the sport. Um, you know, a lot of people will say it's a baseball town. A lot of people, you know, really love their baseball. But in terms of the youth sport there, soccer is, is it. Um, and, and kids grow up, and, and for me, it was always who came before and who's coming behind. And I think that's kind of unique being from St. Louis. That's something that, that we always, you know, we're, we're always very keenly aware of, of who's come before us. Um, and we're also keenly aware of, of who's kind of making that jump, um, you know, after you. Your football education is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. You played for Scott Gallagher, yep. which sounds like a name of, a, of an individual, but obviously that's a team sponsorship, right? Two individuals. Yes, two individuals yep. um, in St. Louis. And the way they played their football yeah. was almost ahead of its time, even before it caught the national consciousness. So tell me about that, because it wasn't lump it and run. No, it never. It was much more cultural than that. Yeah, never lump it and run. We, we would actually... Be in, in very uh, very big trouble if we uh, just kick the ball and, and and try to you know try to be more more physical than than the other team or you know use our, our physical attributes um, because I got to be honest most of us didn't have those um, those attributes there were so many kids and I remember it vividly there were so many kids who were bigger faster stronger um, you know they had they had gone through changes a lot earlier than than a lot of us so. Um, you know, our coach, you know, legendary in, in the St. Louis, you know, area, legendary with, with you know, Gall Scott Gallagher. And he, he wanted to play a very technical, very specific style of play. You know, he liked that, that kind of um, the beautiful game, really. Um, he wanted, wanted you to be technical. He wanted you to be able to play one and two touch, move the ball around and, and beat teams that way. And um, that was a big part of, of you know who I was and who I am now even to this day um, and, and I credit you know that that club and, and um, the coach with with instilling that in uh, in the team which is eye-opening isn't it because particularly in a country that's not seen as being yep. football orientated in, in many respects even the training sessions I know were on tennis courts they took the nets <laughs> down right and you'd have 20 people on a tennis court yep. with no goals yeah playing one two three touch that's it yeah you're bringing back memories now um, yeah I mean even with the, the nets on, we would we would play. Um, Which yeah, and, and uh, I mean, you look back on it now, and it makes sense. Um, you know, you play with, you know, small possession games now on a on a normal pitch, right? And and then obviously you have the lines, and or you have the, the you know the markers, and, and out like, on a tennis court you have that already already painted on. Um, and for us, it just it was just natural. Like we didn't think anything of it. It was okay. How do you get the ball down? How do you, you know, how do you keep the ball from bouncing? How do you, how do you hit clean passes without, you know, the ball skipping everywhere and, and, and having to bounce up and, and, you know, helping the next guy be able to, to process the ball and, and make his decision before the ball even gets to him. So um, it was, it was, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd call it revolutionary, but it was, it was definitely something that, 
you know, we, we took advantage of because the temperatures weren't great. The, the fields that we were playing on, if, if we could get regular ones, great. If not, we were just playing in, in parks. We were training in, in, you know, random parks throughout the, you know, throughout the, the city and the county. And um, it even evolved into, in the, the harsh winter, we would go into warehouses and play on proper concrete floors. Wow. Um, and it was like, you know, you see futsal now, it was, it was before futsal. Which is fascinating because when everybody you know, talks about Tim Ream, the central defender, or left back as it was when you were first growing <laughs> up, left sided centre half, and with the ability to play the passes that you do, you're clearly a product of that cultural upbringing that you were given. Without a doubt. Yeah, okay. yeah without a doubt. Um, and, and that, you know, it started as a, as a, a, you know, a left midfielder, you know, winger to move into to central midfielder to, well, we don't have any, any left back. Well, Tim, you have a left foot, so we're going to put you there. Yeah. Um, and the way, again, the, the way that, that our coach wanted to play, it, it made sense. He didn't want me to, to you know, bomb up and down at, at the time. There, that wasn't necessary. Um, and so he, he wanted someone who could control. And, and so that's, that's where I moved to. And then obviously natural movement in, into the center. Your dedication to football was, I think, pretty clear to all, yeah. for all to see, driving five and a half hours <laughs> to some games yeah. and back, yeah. maybe with a, park, it, it, a speeding ticket in, in the process. In one, in one day, yeah. Um, yeah, that was um, that was when I really started to realize that 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 I could I could play professionally. Um, you know, going to university was was important for me. Um, you know, I wanted to get a, that higher education, but I also I also needed that time to mature and develop. Um, and in that in that process, I was invited to play up in Chicago um, with a development team. And in the summers, I was doing summer school at university so that I could finish school early. I was doing a part-time job working in a, in a soccer shop. Um, and I was traveling for games to and from Chicago. Um, and yeah, I was trying to get back one, one morning to make sure that I made it to class. And I was going a little bit too fast. And the only reason anybody knows about this is because one of my teammates, um, Brandon Barklage at, at university, was also invited to, to, to play in Chicago. And so we, we carpooled together and he was with me and he was, he was so panicked. I remember it. He was so panicked. Oh, you're going to get a ticket. I'm like, well, OK, well, I'm going to get a ticket. I was going a little bit too fast. What am I going to do about it now? Yeah. That's, that's just life. By the way, that is you in a nutshell. Everybody who I speak to about you <laughs> is like, nothing phases Tim. He's, he's chilled to the core. I, what's the point? I, I think, listen, there, there are some times that I, I probably should be a little bit more, um, maybe not on edge, but, but more kind of forward and, and you know, more, more aware and, and more, more alert. But at the end of the day, like, okay, I've, I've been pulled over. What am I going to do about it now? I can't. Mm. There's nothing you can do. Yes, yes, sir. Sorry. I apologize. Um, won't happen again, even though it probably will happen again. Um, but yeah, listen, you, you, you make mistakes, you move on um, and, and you learn from them. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the way I, I approach things. So St. Louis, clearly big in terms of you becoming a footballer. Yep. It's also where you met your future wife. Yeah, at university. Yeah. Who was also a footballer. She did. Yeah, she played. That's the, the running joke. She was actually a better player than me in, um, up, through, up through university. Well, she was an attacking midfielder, so she got the ball a lot more than I did. Um, more glamorous then. More glamorous. Made, made, made a lot more happen than, than I did as a, as a defender. But um, yeah, we, we did. We met, met at university. Not until uh, you know, we were close to, to 21. Um, knew, knew each other, but didn't know each other. Um, you know, kind of mutual friends and um, one of those that develops and snowballs and um, you know here we are um, all these years later with a, with a family. But that dynamic must be quite interesting. Because, oh gosh, yeah. I mean talk to me, does she, does she ever look back at your games and say look hang on a bit, yeah. you should have done this or that? She used to a lot. Did she? Yeah, she used to a lot and then we had three kids and then she's like I can't watch the games, it's impossible. Um, so yeah, it was... She still, to, to this day, will, will ask um, or if she, you know, games are on TV and, and she'll see or she'll see, she sees highlights, she's, well, what, what was happening here? And it's not just me with, with others. She's like, well, what was he thinking? Yeah. Like, 
you know, or what, what was this guy doing? Or why was he all, all the way over there? Um, she knows when things, you know, are good. She knows when things are bad. She knows when, when you've made a mistake, but she also knows when you've done, done something good. And um, it's funny that say you, you haven't made the mistake, but you're in the vicinity. And she's like, well, you know, that's, you, you may be beating yourself up about it, but yeah. what happened before that yeah. was not actually... Didn't quite help. Yeah, yeah. It, it didn't help you. So um, it's, it's good. It, it's, it comes from a different perspective, mm. and I think that's, that's important. Interesting. So your time at St. Louis came to an end. Yep. Um, you moved to Hoboken, funnily enough, where I was. We, we met last time. Yep. Um, in New Jersey while you played for New York Red Bulls. And is it true your spell there reignited something in you to play in Europe? because of the kind of players you were actually playing with then? Um, I mean, I always, once I knew I was kind of in that professional mode, even in, in university where I thought, okay, I have an opportunity, my aspiration had always been to, to move and, and to get a move and, and be able to play in Europe. Um, it was when just, you're playing with Thierry Henry. Of course, obviously, well then you go to New York yeah. and you have a, a European coach um, and then you have a, a Thierry Henry comes in and halfway through the year. You're, you're playing with a, a Juan, Pablo, Juan Pablo Angel who was, was at Aston Villa. Um, you're playing with these, these big names who have been there, done it, and, and you start having these conversations with these guys. And, and you're, they're giving you the affirmation that, listen, you can, you can make that jump. You can, you can get there and you can do well and you can be successful and have a, have a, a really long career. It's like all of a sudden your, your eyes are opened even, even wider and, and you, you do more and you, and you work harder to, to try to be able to make that you know, a reality. Talking of Thierry, funnily enough, when you came to England, you had a trial with West Brom. Yep. Roy Hodgson was the manager at the yep. time. But then Bolton came up with a permanent deal. Yes. But Owen Coyle, when signing you, said something very interesting. I don't think it's been picked up on that much. It said um, you've been followed by some big teams including Arsenal. Yeah. So how close were you, in fact, in joining Arsenal at one point? Uh, that move got blocked, actually. Oh, all right. um, so the way MLS works, obviously, the, the club doesn't own you. The, the league owns your rights. Um, and after my rookie year, um, there, was, there were conversations uh, between um, my agent, Arsenal, MLS New York uh, there was just this big this big thing going on and um, yeah I, I don't know how close it ever was because I, I just you know told everyone listen I either either you get it done or you don't get it done if it's done let me know about it if it's not I, I don't want I don't want that hanging over over me yeah as a, as a cloud so the Arsenal move never happened. Mm. So you go to Bolton instead. Mm -hmm. um, but you had to cancel your honeymoon to postpone, make it. Postpone, postpone, oh, postpone. Postpone, yeah. I stand corrected. Cancel, postpone, cancel sounds really bad. <laughs> it does, yeah. That's a headline grabber. Yeah. But you postponed your honeymoon. Yes. How did. did that go down? Yeah, like a lead balloon. Um, it, uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> we were almost separated as quickly as we were married. Um, it was... It was not uh, not great, to be completely honest with you. Um, but uh, again, it's one of those there where the opportunity came, and, and you know, we had had the the conversation, my wife and I. Um, you know, if the opportunity came, we would we would go. We just didn't expect it to happen less than 24 hours after we had yeah. had been married. So. That was a, a tough sell because um, we were supposed to go to to Tahiti and Bora Bora, um, and we went to Bolton instead. Um, <laughs> From Tahiti to Bolton, and it was it was January and it was cloudy and foggy and rainy and windy and all the best parts of the weather that we get here. Um, but yeah, listen, we we did it. Um, we we ended up postponing until the summer. Um, and we were able to extend instead of just going for the, the bare minimum that, that we had planned to go. So if that's a tough sell, talk about tough boots to fill. Yeah. Gary Cahill's. Yeah. Um, man. And the, the funny thing is, is, is that as, as a, the manager at the time, Owen Coyle, was, was like, listen, you're not coming in to, to fill or be a Gary Cahill. Um, you're not his direct replacement. And... Obviously, that that feels nice. It calms you calms you a little bit, but at the same time, as a player, you're like, 
you know how these things work. You know how, how transfers work. You know how windows work. It's, it's a domino effect, right? And, and he goes, and I'm the first center back in the door. Well, if I'm not his replacement, then who is, right? Um, now, obviously, he, you know, he went on and, and did incredible things. Um, but those are, you know, that's a, that's a tough, uh, you know, a, a tough gig to walk into. It took you two years to become a regular yeah. at the Reebok. I just wonder, how tough was that, those first two years in terms of acclimatising the demand of English football, beating the Championship or the Premier League? I'll tell you what, I know we got relegated, um, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm fairly certain I, I came in and, and played almost every game um, in, in the Premier League. And, and again, like I said, I know, I know we got relegated, but it didn't feel like that big of a jump. And again, maybe it was it was adrenaline for those you know, twelve weeks or whatever it was that I that you came I, in for. I came in for. Um, it was new. It was fresh. It was exciting. It was somewhere I'd always wanted to be. But that drop to the championship. Wow. Let me tell you, that was that was a, the eye opener of all eye openers. Um, I, I just didn't. You, you a you don't get the championship games in in the U.S. at the time. Like I'd never I'd never known anything about the championship. And, and to come in and see how physical it was, how demanding it was to, to have to go a lot of weeks, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, um, how, how intense and how cutthroat like, you know, teams are, are what, what it means to be promoted, I, I didn't, I had no clue. Um, I think I started the first, I don't know, only first handful of games and then dropped. Um, and that's when I really started to understand what it would take, what it, what you had to do as a as a player, as a person, on and off the on and off the pitch to to be able to to succeed um, and play every day and, and and make sure that you're you're ready to go. But then came the chance to join Fulham. Well, yeah. Obviously caught their eye. QPR or Fulham? Yeah, QPR. Yeah. But then Fulham for a for, <laughs> for the permanent one. Yeah. I mean, tell me about this. I mean, Fulham clearly has a long history of long history. American players. Yeah. I mean, Marcus Hanneman sometimes doesn't get talked about. Mm. Brian McBride certainly does. Clint Dempsey clearly is the standout. Does that American affiliation, did that actually help persuade you to go to Fulham? What's crazy is that you only named three people. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I could go on. We, I could go on as well. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, I, I think I've played with just about all of them um, that, have, that have played here which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but yeah, I, I just think for whatever reason, there's, uh, there's a comfort, right? And, and there's a, f a feeling that, okay, guys have gone there, guys have done well, guys have, have solidified themselves as, as key contributors um, and then either stayed as that or, or moved on. Mm. And, and for me, it was, it, it was the same, I, I knew and had talked to the guys who, who had played here before. Um, and it, it just, for me, it made sense. And I remember actually, you know, speaking to, to my wife and saying, you know, the, the, the stadium, like Craven Cottage, like there's just something special about it. Unique. It's so unique. You, you're driving down the, the, the side streets and there's, you know, there's houses and, and you know, the, the tennis courts. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, there's a there's a stadium right here with the you know the cottage in the corner and and I, I told her she you know it's it's one of my favorite favorite places to go um, and I'd only been there once you know when we when we played them in, in the championship and you've been brilliant there nine seasons under yeah. five different managers yeah. um, interestingly it could have been all over after three months yeah yeah it could have um, which is crazy to say um, you know. <laughs> When, when Silvisa comes in, completely changes everything um, for the good. Um, and yeah, after, after that, that season where I think we, at one point we were sitting in eighth, eighth position, they, they sat Kit, Slavisa comes in December, we'd gone on a slide and, and we just stay up. I think only because we won like two or three in a row at the, the tail end of the season. And um, again, had me playing some left back, some center back, in and out of the team for him, and um, had told me I could just leave in the summer. But even though I had four years, 
five, sorry, three years left of my contract. Um, he was like, listen, you're not for me. Um, you know, good what luck, you say good luck with everything. I actually said, you know, when, okay, but when am I due back for preseason? And he was like, well, you're not. Like, you need to go talk to the technical director. Like, we need to find you a new, a new situation. I'm like, okay, but I'm playing with the U.S. team this summer. What, how, mu how much time do I get off and when do I need to be back in for preseason? Um, and he just looked at me like baffled. He was like, D do you understand what I'm telling you? And I was like, yeah, I get it. And mm -hmm. came back in preseason and completely changed, changed his mind. So you just made a point of proving him yeah. wrong? Yeah, but I, d I didn't go into it with, a, like, with the thought of, oh, I'm going to prove you wrong. I went into it with the thought of, well, I'm going to improve. Uh, I'm going to, like, you want to play a certain style. And I know, actually, like, I grew up playing that way. Mm. Like, th that is my... We're back to St. Louis again. That is my bread and butter. Like, yeah. The way you want to play is exactly the way, the way I'm, I've always been able to play. Um, and so... Yeah, I just came in and, and, and did what, what they asked each and every single day in, in, in preseason. And um, at the end of it, he came and shook my hand and said, I was completely wrong. Um, and, and you're now you know, firmly part of, of what we want to do. Um, so you're, we're not going to let you go anywhere. Amongst the other managers, Claudio Ranieri being one of them, um, now Marco Silva. What is Marco really like? <laughs> um, man, he's... He has such high demands, um, in in a good way. It, it's not you know he's not asking you to jump through <clears throat> jump through hoops of fire. Um, you know he's he he knows what what we can do as as individuals. He knows what we can do as as a group, um, and that's what he demands. He, you know he he can see it. He's he's an unbelievable evaluator of talent, um, and and I'm not the only one. You look at what Rodrigo Muniz is doing right now and and for the first two years people are like okay writing it but he's off. 22 years old yeah right now the rest of us were a little bit older it's it's the old adage oh can you teach a, an old dog new tricks well no but you can teach him you, you may not need new tricks but you can teach him you can drill him you can demand better and more from him and that's something that he does so so well um on top of the 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 personal private kind of individual conversations he has with guys. You know, he knows when to put arm an arm around guys. He knows when to, to poke and prod. Um, he just, he, he knows how to, how to level with each player um, individually because we're, we're all different. We're all, you know, we're, we're not robots, even though, you know, a lot of times it may seem like it. He, he knows, he knows, you know, a conversation with me is gonna be completely different to a conversation with, with Rodrigo, with, with Andreas, with Willian. It, it's all, he's, he's, he's just so good at, at reading the room. Finally, yes. your future, what does it hold? You're 36, you've got the Copper America, yeah. you've also got a home World Cup. Mm. Is that the one thing that's driving you on right now? Um, I don't know that it's the one thing. I think, you know, I thought after the last World Cup, I thought I'm not going to make another World Cup because I'm 35. Um, and then the more I thought about it, I was like, well, I could make it. So I'll, I'll make that as a, as a long-term goal. Um, Copa America is firmly in, in my sights. Um, but I think the one thing driving me on right now is, is showing my kids that, that, you know, it doesn't matter how old you are, um, just as it doesn't matter how young you are. If you're, if you're good enough, you're old enough. If you're good enough, you're young enough. Um, and, and for me, that's my, that's my kind of driving force at the, at the minute. Um, that that World Cup is is there. It's it's out in the distance for sure. Um, it is it is a thought, but it's not something that I'm so solely focused on that that I'm gonna you know I'm gonna I'm gonna hurt myself um, you know by trying to get there. Um, I'm, I'm taking it you know each and every single day, each and every single week, and and if I get there, great. If I don't, I've been to a World Cup. I've done that. I've had that experience. Amazing. Would I love to have another one? Of course. Do I need another one to, to feel like I'm, I'm complete? No, of course not, I don't. Brilliant. Tim, it's been great recounting your journey. Thanks for being such a great guest. Thanks for having me. Ready for some decent food? Yeah, let's eat, I'm hungry. <laughs>
Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch more videos all season long. And for even more Premier League content, from original series to live matches, head over to Peacock. And be sure to tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend on USA Network and on Peacock. We will see you there.